All right, y'all, it's time for a recap and analysis of season one, episode two. In this episode, we're going to pick up where we left off. And in terms of story progress, we're going to find out the circumstances behind Holston's decision to exile himself from the silo. We're going to meet Juliet and see how her linking up with Holston helps us understand what made him finally believe that Allison was right. Now, just in case you forgot about the mental notes from the previous episode, I'll do a quick rundown. So we still have that note that says double the flowers in front of the mirror, which was left by Holston. We still don't know what that's about. Two, what did Holston hide in the vent and why? What is the significance of the number 18 on the hard drive casing? Tape on the hazmat suits is important for some reason. Who or what in the world is judicial? Why is everybody so afraid of them? The Jane Carmody cleaning video. Why does that even exist? How did George Wilkins die? And why does Juliet think it was murder? Now, before we begin, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to the three newest patrons, Kimmy, Laurel Shykoff, and Valerie Van Dyken. Just want to say thanks for choosing to support my work here. Always appreciate it. Look for your name in the closing credits on every video going forward. If you're feeling generous and have a couple of bucks to spare and helping the channel out, check out the Patreon. Also, check out the Steadily Growing Discord for the channel. If you're looking for fans of this show or any of the others that I cover, it's free to everyone. I'm going to try to make this video shorter than the first one because that one got kind of crazy. Enough with the preamble. Let's get ready to dive. So this episode starts out with Holston Becker being suited up for his exile from the silo. The ceremony is officiated by Mayor Johns and Deputy Marnes. When asked what his final words would be, Holston responds with, sorry for all the fuss. Mayor Johns repeats the mantra about the silo. The interesting thing that I found here is the mantra says that they don't know when they will be able to go outside, which made me wonder if there was supposed to be some kind of automated notification system that lets them know when it is okay to go outside. Otherwise, how would they know when it's safe to go outside, especially since they don't even know the real reason as to why they're in there in the first place. Interesting. I have a feeling we're not going to get an answer to that anytime soon. So as Holston makes his way up the ramp out of the silo, we are sent to the cafeteria to watch the events from the perspective of the citizens of the silo. Juliet is there and she seems particularly keen on seeing what happens to Holston as he exits. We get a chance to see what Holston sees and it turns out it is exactly what Allison saw. But pay attention to the pattern of the birds here. See it. Notice it. Good. Add that one to the mental notes. Upon seeing all of this, Holston verbalizes his next thought and he says, they have to see it. This shows us that what Allison said initially was correct. Everyone who steps out of the silo is treated to this view and they want people inside to see the same thing. Meanwhile, from the inside, things on the outside look just as bleak and as barren as usual. So what gives? So next we see Holston wiping the lens and the crowd goes wild. Just like Allison, Holston goes down after a few minutes as he tries to leave the area. In fact, he actually removes his helmet at one point and Shirley, who works in mechanical, remarks that she's never seen anyone take off their helmet. Unfortunately for us, we don't get to see the world through Holston's eyes without the helmet, which is really interesting. I call shenanigans here because the direction is clearly trying to hide something from us. And they don't want the audience to see what he sees without the helmet. I also think it's interesting that Holston doesn't look at Allison when he's seeing this perfect version of the world. He would think that that would be the first thing that he'd want to do is go straight to her body, but he doesn't. Holston finally goes down. Once again, the audience inside leaves feeling defeated. They just witnessed the death of their chief law officer and peacekeeper. This is problematic for a few reasons, but the potential for civil unrest in the silo is the biggest concern. Notice too that Juliet looks pissed after seeing Holston go down and she starts yelling that he's a liar. It's at this point that we get a short inspirational speech by a character named Knox, who's apparently the head of Mechanical. And he goes on about how it's none of their business what goes on up top. He says, let them sort it out. We are Mechanical and our only concern is keeping the silo running from down here. This is a kind of compartmentalizing used as a way of excusing non-participation in the problem. But also it distracts from the obvious dangers and insecurities that they're experiencing. They can't change anything and nothing will change for them. Okay, so now we get to cross off one of the clues. We get to find out what's going on. It's the second Second note that was written by Halston. We get confirmation about this little bit of mystery. It turns out this note was written to Marnes and it was meant to be read after Halston was exiled. This is the first time we are really introduced to a character named Sandy. She's apparently the office manager. In an effort to console Marnes about Halston's death, she expresses an affection for Holston, stating that he did it for his wife. In other words, she's saying he didn't die for nothing. Sandy tells Marnes that the residents of the silo are feeling uneasy and they're very concerned about the chaos that might result from his absence. The next key scene is when Mars goes down to John's, who is in the middle of crocheting a gift for an expecting mother. I hope that's crocheting. I'm not even sure. Okay. Writers, we get it. She's not the bad guy. Johns is really just doing her best to keep things under control while the sheriff role is waiting to be filled. She's just a nice old lady. So Marnes tells Johns that he's retiring, so he won't be taking the position. And Johns is concerned about judicial placing one of their guys into the position. They mention a guy named Billings, who was a deputy, but transferred over to judicial. But they characterize him as a good guy. So about judicial. 
and the next scene we meet Mr. Sims. Now this guy is introduced with all of the Terminator slash Grim Reaper vibes you could ever wish for. It's fitting that his entrance is set in a moment where some of the silo citizens are squabbling over weapons they can use for self-defense. The way the other people in the shot react to Sims tells us everything we need to know about his reputation. The way that he handles the situation lets us know that he is higher up in the food chain than the typical deputy. Juliet pays a visit to a character named Walker and she's a straight talker. <laughs> Accidental bars. With an observant eye, she calls out Juliet for storming into her place and fixing stuff as a way of avoiding her real problems. And Juliet is apparently not big on unloading these kind of things, so Walker tries poking around a bit to see what's going on, and she eventually is able to get her to open up. The conversation that they have lets us know that these two go way back, and Walker is somewhat of a mentor and almost like a therapist to Juliet, and she's known her since she was 13 years old. Walker has that kind of patience you only see in older folks. It takes a lifetime to develop that, but it's a lucky thing for Juliet because Walker is able to coax the truth out of her and this is how we get the rest of the story so what do we learn we learned that Juliet and George were a thing, but it wasn't exactly public knowledge because their relationship is technically forbidden or unsanctioned, although they aren't worried about anyone from lower snitching on them. George tells Juliet that he's got something important to show her in secret, and you can tell it's big because he gets very squirrely when he looks over his shoulder to see two judicial goons passing through the area. They plan to meet up after her shift, but he's a no-show. Juliet goes looking for him after her shift and finds his place empty. She spots this bag on the table, and she finds this old rubber ducky Pez dispenser with something attached attached to its bill. Mental note. The next scene, Julia gets very bad news when one of her workmates mentions that George is gone, and it looks like he unlived himself by jumping from a ledge. Juliet is wrecked by the news, but she doesn't believe George did this to himself. She believes he had every reason to keep living, not to mention the secret stuff he's been working on, so it doesn't make sense to her. Juliet then goes to Hank for help, but he tells her no can do. Their relationship wasn't sanctioned by the silo, and she has no evidence for Hank to even begin looking into the cause of death as being a possible homicide. I should mention, Hank is a deputy from the lowers. I don't think I officially introduced this character yet. So here we're getting another taste at the means of control by the silo, the idea of a sanctioned relationship, which under the guise of protecting the overall welfare of the silo could also be a means of controlling which relationships are recognized as legitimate and the rights that that entails. Tales. There is an obvious benefit to the silo in having these controls, but it's easy to see where this can be abused. That said, Hank tries to push the issue up top with Holston on Juliet's behalf, and that's why we see Holston and Barnes come down to the lowers at the end of the first episode. Little sidebar, notice how Juliet seems to get very nervous in the presence of anyone from the upper level. I like this small detail because it solidifies the notion that people in the lowers don't mix much with the people above, and vice versa. We finally get these two important characters alone in a conversation. Holston does the cop thing and dryly asks her about the watch that she's wearing and notices that it's a relic, letting us know that he's not dumb. He knows more than he's letting on. The good news is Halston is interested in clearing this inquiry as a murder. So he's all in and looking into the case, just in case. He's not 100% in, but he's taking Juliet's word and believes that her claims are being made in good faith. At the cafeteria, Halston keeps doing the detective thing and asks about Juliet's romantic relationship with George. He tells her the not knowing is going to haunt you forever, which I think he's qualified to say. It's a hint at what he's experiencing right now, not knowing what Allison knew and how she found out and why that caused her to do what she did is killing him inside. I think it's because of this that he's feeling pretty sympathetic for Juliet in this scene, and it makes sense given his experiences. Juliet is beginning to trust him, so she reveals that George left something for her. She shows him the ducky and part of the message that says, remember where you saw this last. We have no idea what that means yet, but we're about to find out. Also notice that the note is torn, so she intentionally hid part of the message from Holston because she doesn't completely trust him, as we said earlier. Juliet takes Holston to a hidden area that he was not even aware of. After climbing through a hidden hole in the wall, they find themselves in a tunnel covered with graffiti. Juliet mentions that the writings were probably from before the rebellion 140 years ago. I'm keeping this one in the mental notes unofficially because I want to see if there's anything we can learn from these messages written on the wall. If I do find anything, it will definitely turn up in a theory video coming in the future. So this hidden area that we're in right now is the same place that George found in the blueprints on the hard drive from episode one. This ginormous chasm of hollowed out earth and massive drill are quietly resting well below the silo floors and no one has any idea they are there. Well, at least most people don't. George apparently found this place and set up shop before he passed. While looking for clues, Juliet produces a metal container that she says is the last place she saw the Pez dispenser, as indicated by the note. In the box, they find a handheld camera, but they don't recognize it as such because they don't have cameras. I'm assuming this falls under the strict pact rules against powerful magnification on lenses. Okay, so a few more clues. Keep in mind that Holston wants to know what Allison and Judge were up to, so he does have an ulterior motive here when it comes to the investigation. Helping Juliet here might also help himself when it comes to getting answers as to what his wife actually discovered. 
Juliet is able to find a hard drive and the notes that Allison wrote hidden in yet another bag of goodies. This is about the time where Juliet figures out that Halston was familiar with George and that's why he knew about the relic watch. So there's a little bit of static here because she thinks Halston only wants to know about his wife's activities from that time period, but it's also because he wants to burn every bit of evidence they have because if they get caught with this stuff, they're both heading outside. In the middle of this heated moment, Juliet tells Holston that if he had listened to his wife, Allison, maybe she'd be alive today. Turns out that was a bad idea. Holston reminds Juliet in no uncertain terms of what he's going through and details that he goes to work early and leaves after sundown just so he doesn't have to see Allison's body on that hill every day. This is also to caution Juliet about the possible outcome of being a little too determined to satisfy her curiosities. She could end up just like Allison. Very good scene here. I get the feeling that Holston sees a lot of similarities between Allison and Juliet and maybe he thinks he can make different choices this time and listen instead of giving in to fear. The point here, they have to trust each other if anything good is going to come out of the situation, which is a tall order given what they stand to lose. Alright, so we jump back to Juliet and Walker again when she's telling this story about what happened and she mentions that she didn't give Holston the entire note. The rest of the note says, I found what I was looking for. So what does this mean? We don't know yet. It's a good guess that he found a way to get to the secret door under the water in the pit below the silo. One thing we know for sure is that it's definitely bigger than any relic they could have found. It's also big enough of a deal that he was scared to tell Juliet about it because he was afraid that if he got caught, she'd get implicated. Now in the final scene, Juliet grabs some rope and tries to descend down to the water hoping to find whatever it is that George found. I imagine she was trying to get to the door here, but she not only drops her light source on the way, but she gets to the bottom of the rope only to find out that it's too short for her to even reach the water. And I also think it's quite possible that she doesn't know how to swim. I, I would imagine that many people in the silo don't know how to swim, so this would be absolutely terrifying for her to try to do. Anyway, that's how the episode ends. I thought overall, this was a decent episode. Um, it did a lot in terms of telling us or showing us how Holston and Juliet intersect with each other story-wise, and it gives us insight into, you know, what drives him to make the decision that he makes in the first episode. Anyway, so we're gonna stop here and pick it up again in the next episode. That should be very soon. Once again, I wanna say thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel, but I also wanna say thank you to everyone. Everyone who's been supporting the channel, likes, comments, all of that stuff helps out a lot. I don't ask much for any of that kind of stuff, but I definitely appreciate it. Anyway, so that's it for this one. Be good to yourself and be good to others. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.